be the last have to be the last virtual speaker here. Hopefully, uh, you guys can be in person for your for your uh, next one. And so, what I'll be talking about today is uh, conifers for Michigan landscape. And I have the little subtitle here: the good, the bad, and the underused. And I was just trying to be clever there. But what we'll do is we'll go through this. And we'll talk about different forms of conifers, different types of conifers, hopefully convince you all that there is uh, more to conifers than just uh, pines. And I am waiting for my, oh, there we go. Finally got to advance. Uh, <laughs> try to show you the diversity of conifers, both in terms of you know, species and different types of conifers that are out there, but also in terms of the different types of forms of conifers, the different size classes of conifers, and the different ways that we can use conifers to uh, prov provide contrast elements, specimen plantings, screening from views, all those kind of things that we typically associate with uh, conifers, but there's a lot more to it than just pines and a lot of the general public. They think every evergreen is a pine. Uh, it might be a spruce, it might be a fir, it might be something else, but there's a lot out there and a lot we can do if we understand the diversity, understand the different types of conifers that are available out there. And of course, one of the beauties of conifers is they give us, you know, year round interest. I know we're tired of seeing snow and icicles, but uh, there's a lot we can do. We can get interest from the bark, uh, lots of different ways that conifers can provide interest in our landscapes and can do a lot more than simply screen off the neighbors, which is, you know, oftentimes what a lot of people want to do when they think of, you know, planting conifers is trying to get that uh, view blocked and lots of things we can do with miniature conifers in terms of container gardening, uh, we see a lot of interest these days in railroad gardens, for example, where we use G-scale uh, railroads and we use the conifers, the miniature conifers as, as real life accents. So let's go through this and I guess we'll start, uh, begin at the beginning, I suppose, if you're, if you're doing something like this and what is a conifer. And so when we look at you know, higher plants and how they have evolved, there are really two main groups of, of plants and hopefully somewhere along the way in your master gardener training you learn kingdom phylum or division class order family genus species right so we have a hierarchy of plant classification and the gymnosperms split off from the angiosperms pretty pretty early on as we go through those uh, those classifications. Really, once you get below kingdom, right, we get to class and we split off. The angiosperm, which of course are flowering plants, typically broadleaf, could also be things like grasses, you know, or in the angiosperms, we have monocots and dicots, and hopefully you all remember that from your, from your training. But on the other side, away from the angiosperms, are then the gymnosperms. And so what we're showing here is sort of the hierarchy of uh, gymnosperms. So we break those off from the angiosperms and then, you know, ferns and mosses and uh, those kind of things have also been, are often in other uh, orders as well. But we get this group here that is called the, the uh, Pinophyta. And so that group is all of what we typically consider to be conifers. Now there are other things in the gymnosperms that are not conifers. You know, some people know ginkgo. So ginkgo is one of these sort of evolutionary orphans uh, and it's off here down by itself. There are also things called cycads. Some people may be familiar with, look a lot like uh, maybe a, a palm or a fern or something like that. They're actually in the gymnosperms, but they're not part of the conifers. So let me try real quick here. I'm gonna see if I can get my little pointer to work here. I do better when I have something to point with. So all this group up here, this Pinophyta, this is the order that includes all of the, uh, what we would typically consider to be conifers, okay? And so there are several families, and again, you learn kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And of course, scientific name, everything is genus, species. So we're looking here at the, at the level of uh, scientific classification uh, above, right above genus would be families. And so all these families here represent all of the conifers. There are three families 
of conifers that we see in North America that you would commonly see uh, around here. And that would include the, the Pinaceae or the pine family. And we'll talk about each of these families. Well, two of the three families we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, the pine family, uh, which includes pines, firs, spruces, Douglas fir, uh, hemlock, a few other things. Uh, the Cupressaceae, which includes quite a few genera and some things you'll be familiar with, eastern red cedar, arborvitae, okay, or in the Cupressaceae or cypress family. And then the other family of conifers that we have here in North America is the Taxaceae or the yews. You will notice I'm not going to spend a lot of time on use. Uh, they're not terribly interesting. And uh, so I think there's a lot more fun conifers to talk about. So the tax AC are in there, but but we won't spend much time with them. Some of these other things that you see on here, the Aracari ACE, the Podocarp ACE, a lot of these are Southern Hemisphere uh, plants. They're still conifers, uh, but we don't uh, tend to see them other than maybe in a, you know, an arboretum or something like that, or a uh, conservatory, something like that. So we won't, we won't spend uh, much time talking about them. We will talk about the ones that occur here. What are some characteristics of conifer? We said they have this whole group of plants within the gymnosperms. What makes them unique? Well, the term conifer comes from the fact that they're cone bearing, which most of you probably knew before you started this presentation here. We don't call them flowers. We'll sometimes say they're flowering, especially if we're working with, as I do sometimes, with seed orchards and things like that, where we're looking at the pollen flowers coming out or the uh, cone flowers coming out. Technically, they're not flowers. They're stro stroboli, uh, but we'll sometimes slip into that. They have separate male and female structures. Uh, but they're usually on the same tree. Oftentimes, you'll see, if you'll notice, uh, this past year, in 2021, we had a lot of cones, especially on some spruces. And you'll notice that the cones, typically the female stroboli, are up in the upper third, oftentimes or upper half of the crown. And then the pollen stroboli are usually pretty inconspicuous and they're usually at the bottom of the tree. And the reason for that is it's kind of a check against self-fertilization. They want to outcross. And so if you have the you can't see my hands, but if they have the female uh, structures at the top uh, and the male structures at the bottom, they're less likely to self, which obviously we don't want to have happen. These are all wind pollinated, produce copious amounts of pollen oftentimes. If you're ever down south uh, this time of year and have any friends or travel down to you know, Georgia or North Florida, places like that, when their uh, southern pines are all producing pollen, it can, it can really make a mess. And around here as well. Uh, different types of cones or structures that you'll see. There are some that have sort of fleshy cones, and that would be things like, you know, eastern red cedar junipers uh, tend to have these type of, of berry-like or use often have these berry-like or, or fleshy cones. But a uh, common thing is that they have needle-like or scale-like leaves, and we'll show you some examples of these. And they're mostly but not entirely evergreen. There's actually several useful and interesting conifers that are deciduous. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of those and some things that I actually recommend quite often for people to use around their, their yards. Just a little bit about these families. Again, I won't talk much about the use. They're just not that interesting. Uh, but the cypress family certainly is. It's a very diverse group of uh, plants um, among the conifers that occur in North America. It's certainly the most diverse family. They have the scale-like needles. So again, think about arborvitae and junipers and things like that. Those are in the cypress family. Typically small, inc you know, inconspicuous cones. There's about uh, 25 different genera. So pretty diverse group of plants. I'm showing here on the left is, is a juniper, uh, emerald green arborvitae, and then uh, giant sequoias there on the right. That's a picture I took out at uh, Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park. And if you look at that picture, take a second and look down here at the bottom. Those are people. <laughs> so if you've never, if you've never been out there to see the giant sequoias, you, you definitely need to make a trip because it's a, it's a site unlike uh, any other. This, the cypress family also includes bald cypress, which is the deciduous conifer. This is actually on the state capitol grounds in Olympia, Washington, which is my hometown. But bald cypress will actually do quite well here in Michigan. And we have quite a few around campus. And I'll show you one from uh, my old place here in, in a few minutes. The pine family is the other major group of conifers that we'll talk about. 
in, in this talk. Uh, these have needle-like leaves. I think most of you are familiar with what a pine, pine needle looks like. They have usually woody or semi-woody cones. So semi-woody, if you think about something like a spruce cone, that's kind of papery, uh, has those papery kind of scales on it. And there's uh, roughly 11 genera and about, well, well over 200 different species. A lot of them uh, are pines. I think there's 50 some different species of, of pines out there. So the, the pine family includes a diverse array of conifers, many that are common and many that you're very familiar with. So firs, uh, which is the genus Abies, and this is uh, Rick Bates, a friend of mine, professor at uh, Penn State. Uh, Rick, like, like I do, uh, spends a lot of time working on Christmas trees, and so this is Nordman fir. This is a fir species that's actually native to Europe that the Europeans use a lot for Christmas trees, and we're finding some interest uh, in it as a Christmas tree here in, in the US as well. And so what are some of the characteristics of the fir? Well, one thing you see here is this very sort of symmetrical growth. And one of the reasons why we use firs so much as Christmas trees is this very nice pyramidal upright habit, very uh, symmetrical tree. Often they have very uh, attractive foliage. This Norman fir is this dark green uh, needles to it. Other things that are characteristic about firs, I'm not showing it in this picture here, but, but they tend to bear their cones upright, which is unique. Most other conifers will have their cones sort of hanging down. The other thing that's unique about firs is their cones don't persist. So in the fall, what will happen with fir cones is they basically just disintegrate. They'll have these stalks left on the tree and the, the seed are just on the ground. So you don't walk along and say, oh, there's a fir cone on the ground because they don't fall that way. They just, they just disintegrate, which is, which is different from other, other firs. Uh, Larix, which is a fir that's, or excuse me, a conifer that's native uh, here in, in Michigan. Uh, we have tamarack uh, here is native or larch is native here. And again, this is noteworthy because it's, it's a deciduous conifer. And there are some ornamental forms of larch that often find their way into, into the nursery trade. And, and we may run across a few as we go through here. Hemlocks, uh, this is uh, Eastern hemlock. So hemlocks are part of the pine family. Their needles are single on the stem. And we'll talk about the characteristics of different members of the pine family here, but they have uh, needle-like leaves. Hemlocks tend to form fairly small cones. They look just like a little, little mini pine cone. Um, and then Douglas fir, if you've ever been out to the Pacific Northwest, out to Oregon or Washington State, you probably have gone out into Western Washington, Western Oregon, and a lot of the really big trees that you see out there are Douglas fir. Douglas fir is not a true fir. Remember, we said that the firs are in the genus Abies. Uh, Douglas fir actually is its own genus. It's Pseudosuga, which means false hemlock. So this tree has a true identity crisis. But we hyphenate Douglas fir to indicate the fact it's not a true first. When you see it in writing, you'll see that little hyphen in there. And that's just to, to designate it. It's not a, a true fur. It doesn't have the upright cones. They tend to hang down. I don't know that I have any pictures of them in here. They tend to hang down and they've got kind of this characteristic pitchfork bracket, uh, pointed buds. Douglas fir actually fairly easy to, to identify uh, from other, other firs or other types of conifers. Spruces make up a big portion of, of trees that we use in the landscape, and we'll talk about those. Uh, one of our things, spruces tend to have sort of sharp needles when you, when you grab them um, in terms of telling spruces from firs, which, which can sometimes be difficult. They have some similarities. Uh, a big one with spruces is, again, they tend to be pokey. So we talk about friendly firs because you can grab them and they won't poke you back, whereas the spruces will, especially blue spruce. Also, the needles of spruces are sort of square and cross section. So you can, I don't know if you guys can see my hands or not, but you can, you can rub your, if you have a spruce needle, you can rub it between your thumb and your forefinger. It'll sort of roll around, whereas firs tend to be flattened. And so you can't do the little roll test with them, things we do with students when we're walking around and testing on these things. Of course, the biggest group of, of the pine family are the pines themselves. So this is the genus Pinus. And these are characterized by these more or less woody cones. This happens to be Austrian pine, which we'll talk about here in a second. The other big thing with pines and what characterizes pines is the fact that their needles occur in groups, usually in groups of either twos and threes or in fives. 
So if you go to grab these needles off of here, and I hope you can follow my pointer, if you go to pluck those needles off of an Austrian pine, you're going to get two or three needles. They won't come off just as one. And, if it, and so the, the pines that have the needles in groups of twos and threes, we refer to as the hard pine group. So things like Austrian pine, Scotch pine, jack pine, red pine, uh, these are all pines that we would classify as, as the hard pine or sometimes called the yellow pine group. If you're down south, they talk about southern yellow pines. Those are all pines that have needles in groups of twos and threes versus the pines that have their needles in fives. Those are what we call the white pine group. So eastern white pine, western white pine, there's a southwestern white pine. I'll talk about uh, uh, pinus flexilis here in a, in a little bit. So there are these, these soft pines or five needle pines as well. Um, it can be important in some cases, there are some diseases that are specific to white pines that don't occur in the other pines, white pine blister rust, for example. So it can, it can make a difference. Again, here's this notion of fascicles. So in pines, we have these needles in groups. Okay, I think this is actually a bristlecone pine here, but you can see all these needles, hopefully that you're following this, are, are clumped together in fives versus something like a spruce over here. And I believe this is either Norway spruce or uh, oriental spruce. I <laughs> hard to tell without my my uh, the rest of the slide here. But anyway, you see the needles are single on the stem. So that would be characteristic of spruces, firs, Douglas fir, hemlock. Okay, are all going to have their needles single on a stem versus in, in groups. So that's how we can tell uh, pines from other conifers. And so, uh, you know, lots of things we can do with these when we start putting these different types of uh, conifers together and grouping our pines, grouping our spruces, grouping our uh, junipers, different things uh, together in these, in these uh, things. So when I went through some of those slides just now, you will notice that there were a lot of different dwarf and unusual forms of conifers. And that's one of the things that generates a lot of interest. Those of you that have been down to Hidden Lake Gardens, we have the Harper Collection of Dwarf and Unusual Conifers. It's one of the premier conifer collections in the country. There are about well over 500 different selections down there. This is just uh, an example of a few right in this uh, picture. And so when you look at those last few photos I showed you and, and what you're seeing in front of us here and you think, well, you know, I, I hike, I spend a lot of time in the woods. I don't see things that look like this. Uh, you know, where do these things come from? And they, they come from a couple of places. They're, they're mutants, okay? And so they can occur a couple of different ways. This one here is um, a Norway spruce, uh, the one that's kind of weeping in front of us there. And this is a Picea abies. So Picea abies is the genus and species for Norway spruce. And this is one called Inversa. And so what happens with Inversa, uh, that's the cult of our name, is you get this lack of apical dominance, right? So normally you've all seen Norway spruce around your neighborhoods. You know, this very tall upright tree has a sort of ski slope. Again, you can't see me here, but my arms are looking like, like uh, ski jumps here, but they've got those ski jump kind of, kind of uh, branches that turn up sort of towards the ends. And so what happens with this particular cultivar is they've lost, the tree has lost that apical dominance, that, that inclination to grow upward and get the normal pyramidal habit that we get out of conifers. Where does that come from? Well, one way we get these unusual conifers is through seedling mutants. And so if you think about you know, something like a warehouser or international paper, these uh, companies that grow millions upon millions of seedlings for reforestation or for Christmas trees or other things. If you're growing, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of seedlings, you know, every so often, even if it's only one in a million, uh, you're going to get some kind of mutant or some kind of variation. And so uh, growers that are alert for this can, can, snag those and if they think it's something interesting they can graft that and then propagate that on and that's and that's exactly what happens if any of you are ever over on the west side of the state and have an opportunity to go by armantrout's nursery over by allegan uh, dave armantrout's been in the nursery business well, actually i think he's second generation his son's now running it so it's third generation but armantrout's nursery uh, they grow seedlings they also grow trees for landscaping and over the years 
Dave has collected a, a bunch of seedling mutants from his nursery. And so out in front, there's a, a kind of a crossroads there, a highway and another road cross there. And he's got all these different mutants planted out in front. And he's got all kinds of things that look like this that are twisted and gnarly and weeping and, and doing different things. So the seedling mutants is one way that we get these, get these things. The other thing that can happen is we get uh, what's called a witch's broom. And so hopefully you can follow my pointer up in the top of this tree. I believe this is a white pine. Um, this is a witch's broom. So you see this sort of congested growth here, this sort of anomalous growth. This is just natural variation. Something happened at a, in a bud back somewhere way back here. And this just continued to grow and continue to grow. And you get that, that congested growth. I know a lot of you know Rebecca Finneran uh, from the MSU Extension. This is actually near the, uh, what's, what's Grand Rapids, Ottawa County? Anyway, the, the <laughs> MSU Extension episode by, by Grand Rapids, this is a Norway spruce and this is a witch's broom up at the top of this, uh, of this Norway spruce. If you take cuttings off of this and you propagate it, graft it, you will get you know, a, little, a, little, uh, a little tree. Um, the people that are into conifers, so I'll talk in a little bit about the American Conifer Society, uh, also called the ACS. Um, some people think ACS stands for American Conifer Society. Other people say it stands for addicted conifer syndrome because these people kind of get hooked on these things. You know, maybe they start with a dwarf Alberta spruce or some other little conifer. And then after a while, it kind of trips their trigger. And, you know, they're sneaking off to the nursery and they've got to hide the credit card statements. You know, all these things, they, they get hooked on these things. One of the things that happens is once people really get hooked and they get into propagating these things, you know, they keep a ladder in the back of their truck. And if they happen to see one of these witches brooms, they're going to stop and they're going to get cuttings off of it. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to tailgate these people because they will stop unexpectedly. And so, uh, you know, folks that get their first, you know, witches broom, they're called baby broomers. And so it's, it's really a, a, a big thing. And so um, some of them, they'll shoot them down, right? It's a big one like this. You know, they might take a rifle and, and hopefully not in a neighborhood like this, but if they were out in the, out in the woods somewhere, they might, they might shoot these down and get the cuttings off of it. And so way the way this works, so this is at Hidden Lake Gardens. This is actually, uh, we talk about the Harper Conifer Collection. This is uh, me and Chubb several years ago. Chubb, unfortunately, no longer with us, but uh, this is a tree called the Merrill Broom Tree that's at Hidden Lake Gardens. And if you look down here, the bottom part of this is just a normal Norway spruce, but here is the broom part of it. And, and they transplanted it there to Hidden Lake Gardens many years ago. Dave Merrill found it. And then uh, I think it was, in a, it was a Christmas tree plantation. I'm trying to remember the story, how, it, how he found it. But in any event, uh, the tree was transplanted to Hidden Lake Gardens and we use it there as kind of a, a demo and, and teaching aid. And so uh, this is the Merrill broom tree. So if you take cuttings off of this, you won't get a normal Norway spruce. What you're going to get is you're going to get this, right? So we take cuttings off of this, we graft them, and that's how we get these globe forms and some of these dwarf forms. And there are things that come off of these witch's brooms. It can also be variegation. There can be different things that happen. And then by propagating them by cuttings, sometimes more typically by grafting, then we can propagate these things on. And that's what you see if you go to G farms or some of these places that specialize in these unusual uh, conifers. Okay. So just as an aside here, so we said that we can have these, I'm going to go forward here a little bit. We can have these witches brooms. We take the cuttings, we get a little tree. Well, the opposite can also happen. And it actually happens more often than you might think. And if you you keep an eye open. Now that I've shown you this, you're likely to see this. This is a reversion on a dwarf Alberta spruce. So a dwarf Alberta spruce, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is you know, a dwarf form of actually uh, Picea uh, abies. It's a, not Picea abies, it's Picea glauca. It's a form of white spruce. And so what happens is just like we had that mutation that caused that witch's broom, you can have a reversion and part of that tree will revert back to its normal growth form. 
And usually the way it goes, is I get a call and a homeowner, somebody says, I got a tree growing out of my tree. What's going on? And that's what's going on here with this reversion. And I have shown you this. If you go by any graveyard, a cemetery, there's usually lots of dwarf Albertas out there. And I'd say about one in 20, if not more, will eventually throw a reversion. And you'll see this little part of it that's that's growing out that looks like a tree growing out of a tree. And that's a and that's a reversion. So that's that's getting back to it. Um, I've already mentioned, you know, addicted conifer syndrome, American Conifer Society. Uh, encourage you, if you have any interest at all in this stuff, to uh, to look them up. Um, just Google American Conifer Society. Uh, you'll go right to their page. They've got a really nice uh, web page, lots of images, lots of information. Uh, there's local chapters. They have national meetings. They have regional meetings. And, uh, uh, you know, you're, you've not lived to you really yeah, spend some time with these coneheads. It's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great time. But one of the things the American Conifer Society does is when you look in catalogs and so forth, um, we have to have a way so that we're all speaking the same language, right? And so what they do is they classify these conifers based on their growth rate and then also their form. And so if you pick up a catalog, there's a lot of these places now do mail order and that sort of thing. And so when you look these up, then you know what you're, what you're going to get. Some of these things, there's miniatures. So these things are going to grow less than an inch a year. So when they say the growth rate, they're talking basically about growth in any direction because some of these things, right, are mounding or weeping or whatever. So it's really growth in, in any direction. So less than an inch a year. So you could have a 10-year-old plant that could be less than a foot tall, okay? And so rock gardens, railway gardens, these kind of things, container gardening, you know, they're, they're perfect for, for that kind of thing. So tight spaces or just this contrast, you have to be a little careful. You don't want to get them lost in the shuffle, but there's lots of things you can do with these, with these miniatures. And then the next size up would be dwarf conifers. Most of you know, know dwarf Alberta spruce. And those are going to grow, use about an inch to six inches per year. So again, you have tight spaces. That's a good, a good, a good use uh, for those dwarfs. And then there's intermediates. And so this is, um, I think in scientific names. So this is Abies lassia carpa uh, variety arizonica. This is uh, compact uh, cork bark fir. So uh, Abies lassia carpa is uh, subalpine fir and then arizonica is the Arizona form, it's actually a geographic variety. So cork bark fir, um, and then, uh, so it's gonna grow probably less than, less than a foot a year. So, you know, if you got a, a decent size, you know, suburban yard, you could easily handle this guy without it uh, taking over your, your home. One of the biggest mistakes we see with a lot of conifers, you know, some of these things get sheared in the nursery like a Christmas tree. And so you think you've got this white pine that oh, this is great, it's six feet tall. Oh, looks like a Christmas tree and you plop it next to the house okay a white pine can grow three feet a year once it's established and so next thing you know this thing is, is swallowing up the house so be, be sure to pay attention to the growth rate when you're when you're choosing these things and then we've got the big boys the large conifers these are things that can grow more than a foot a year and, and many of our conifers if they're the straight species are not one of these dwarf or other cultivars will often fit in this category, white pine, Norway spruce, blue spruce. This happens to be uh, bald cypress over by uh, Anthony Hall here on the MSU uh, campus, and that's going to be a large conifer. So in addition to the size, so how fast this thing going to grow is what is, the, what is the form. And these are a little subjective, and they tend to change over time. A lot of these globe forms, and again, we like the different you know, we're looking for contrast. People that are going to garden with these things are looking for contrast, you know, to have the weeping, the globe, all these different forms together. Uh, so the globe form obviously is, is this rounded appearance. Oftentimes this changes with age. So they can be globe when they're small and then maybe they get more sort of mounded uh, as they get as they get older. Uh, weeping form. We talked about larches earlier. This is a weeping larch out in uh, a home out in Oregon. We certainly have weeping larches that will grow here. Uh, narrow upright, these are often nice as either uh, focal points in the landscape or also you can put these together to screen views. This is at Hidden Lake Gardens. Uh, there's also a group of, of upright conifers. There's DeGroote Spire Arborvitae that they have planted 
uh, between the main conifer collection and the conservatory area. And there's kind of like a shop area and so forth. And so they have the, uh, the root spires there to kind of form a, a living fence to, to block the view. Makes a nice, nice, uh, nice job there. Uh, there are some that have no apical dominance. Uh, this is a microbiota, uh, Russian cypress. And so this, and there's several junipers that do this as well that have this very ground hugging. You can use it as a ground cover basically uh, if you want to. And then kind of a catch all category brought up, right? I sometimes call these the, the working class conifers, you know, <laughs> the ones that kind of often we use for screening and things like that. Uh, this is actually a, a form of blue spruce called Walnut's Glen. There you kind of see the, it looks like it's maybe sort of, sort of faded out, but that's actually the natural, you see the yellow tipping here, that's actually a natural, uh, the natural characteristic of this particular form of, of blue spruce. But we'll talk about blue spruce later and maybe why we don't want to plant uh, blue spruces. Uh, spreading forms, so things that can be used as sort of foundation plants, uh, those types of things. Uh, you know, and then things that don't fit anywhere else. This is a, uh, this is a jack pine cultivar, Pinus banksiana. Uh, this is called Uncle Foggy, and it has this sort of, sort of creeping habit this is nobody turned this pot over that's the that's the way this thing naturally grows. you see it sort of sort of creeping along the ground it's like like the uh, uh creeping uncle foggy i'm not sure what the where the the name came from but uh, uh sometimes there's a history uh and then you know this isn't really a, a form itself there you know things can be uh shaped as as topiaries this is from isley nursery out in Oregon that specialize in these things and they do different animal shapes and geometric things and they'll graph things together so you can have you know part of the conifer they'll, they'll stack them so it's like green yellow green and they'll have different combinations of things um, this is my daughter who's now 27 probably mortified that I included this I still include this slide in my talks but, uh, but there's lots of things out there that we can do and these are often trained so what this is so these are globe forms of spruce and then they're grafted high on the standard so you get this lollipop on a stick effect uh, that some people like and some people don't really care for here's some weeping forms that they are uh, training on these uh stakes here and then what happens is if you quit staking it then it's going to hang down right so how do you get a weeping form up to a certain height well you stake it and then you let it go and now it's going to go down from that from that point that's what they do in on these nurseries again a lot of these are out in oregon where they specialize in this kind of thing this is actually at uh, g farms so many of you probably have been to g farms if you ever do go to g farms one thing i would recommend is ask if you can go see their arboretum and across the road so if, you, if you're there they've got like the farm market and the main part of the nursery but across the road from the nursery gary g who's very active and, and actually has provided a lot of the plants for hidden lake gardens and gary does a lot of his own propagation a great plantsman and so uh this is part of of gary g's arboretum and he's got actually more different types of conifers and he has a few other deciduous things as well uh a broadleaf plants as well but there's actually more different types in his arboretum there is at hidden lake gardens uh he's got a lot of of unique things and this is actually a little archway this is just uh, eastern white pine i think a weeping eastern white pine but he has actually uh kind of fused a couple of these two together and made this little archway and this is crystal one of our former students here from msu walking through the the arboretum there so and there's lots of stuff you know the, the limits the limits the imagination on these things right whatever you want to whatever you, you want to do um so i'm going to go through and i i put in my subtitle here you know the good the bad and the underused and i kind of want to talk about a few conifers that i would uh, recommend uh, a few that i wouldn't and then a few more that i'll recommend so hopefully on balance i i leave more positive <laughs> than negative out of this thing. So the good, what are we talking about? Well, things that are that are adapted here in our area. Pest-free, always dangerous, right? Nothing is pest-free. And, and the more you type something is pest-free, the more likely something's going to come up and, and nab us. But um, things that have generally good form, good growth rate, and, and hopefully are fairly low maintenance. And, and one of the ones I would put on this list 
is eastern white pine. It does have a few issues, and, and we'll talk about that. Probably the biggest one right now is uh, white pine weevil, and that and that is a little bit of an issue with, with white pine. But otherwise, uh, something that's native in our area that typically will grow well, especially if people ask for something that can you know, screen off of you and, and grow fast. As I mentioned, a well-established white pine, uh, not uncommon to get three feet of growth out of it in a year. Um, you know, of course, our, lim our lumbering era here in Michigan, we had the whole era, you know, the, the Hackley and, and all the folks in Muskegon and, and along the west side of the state made their fortunes off of uh, lumbering and, and we cut over the whole state. Uh, but a lot of history in, in white pine, both in that regard and then uh, down here at the bottom, uh, of course, uh, some of this has been co-opted by by some more current political groups, but uh, I've been watching the, I don't know if anyone's watching the PBS thing on Ben Franklin, it's been pretty interesting. And they talked about the where the don't tread on me flag came from, but there was also another uh, flag from that, from that era. And that's this one over here, which is an appeal to heaven, which actually features the white pine. White pine figured prominently in the uh, revolution because uh, the British used to come over one of the things that, among many things that upset the colonists, but uh, the British used to come over and they would mark the best white pines for the mass for the, the Royal Navy ships. And so that's that's how a white pine figures in, in history. Uh, again, fast growing. So when we when we establish white pine, you can. So we know we can age trees by counting the rings. You can also age pines by counting the whorls of branches. So kind of hard to see exactly where the whorls are. But if I have a whorl here, a whorl here, every whorl of branches is the year's growth. And so these are some white pines over by the uh, IM building here on, on our campus. And the distance between some of these whorls, that's how much those trees grew in that year. And there are some whorls here that are about four feet apart. So I know those trees are growing at least four feet a year uh, for part of that time when they were when they were. Uh, growing there so fast growing lots you can do with it i showed you the uh, the archway there at gary g's arboretum this is at uh, the morton arboretum and they've actually hedged these you got to do this every year but you could edge you can hedge almost anything if you want to here's a weeping white pine uh, it's a yard over in suburban chicago a uh, great specimen right so it's a great great plant to, to contrast you've got the uh Japanese maple there, some other things going on to give you some, some contrast. Con color fir, Abies con color. So we talked about the genus Abies being the first. Um, lots of reasons not to plant blue spruce, and I'll go through those here in a little bit. But if you're thinking about a potential alternative, uh, con color fir, Abies con color. Out west, where I grew up, we called it white fir, but out here they call it con color for Abies con color in any event and this is a great uh, great tree good growth rate it's probably in the large conifer category uh, probably get about a foot maybe a little more a year on the so you need a little bit of space but uh, they can be as blue as a blue spruce there are actually some cultivars that have been selected for their blue color so things like blue cloak and candy cans uh, these are cultivars of con color fir, Abies con color that have been selected for uh, their intense blue color. Fairly shade tolerant, something we won't see with all of our conifers. So that's kind of a nice thing. So if you're looking for an evergreen, something that can handle a little bit of shade, uh, that's certainly uh, Abies con color would fit the bill. Here's a conica. So you can kind of see this narrow upright form, conical shape. So you can see where the cultivar name comes from. Serbian spruce, so Picea omerica. So Picea is the genus for spruces. Another very nice upright um, conifer, narrow form. This is the natural form of this conifer. There are also some cultivars that are even more tightly uh, conical than, than this one. Uh, an interesting growth habit. These are, we've been planting some on campus and you get a little bit like Norway in the sense that you kind of get this upturned uh, branching. And one of the things, hopefully you can pick it up on this picture here that makes Serbian really attractive is that the needles have the silvery underside to them. So when you get these upturned things, you get the sort of contrasting effect and it's it's quite striking. Only downside, and, and I'm backing off a little bit on my, on my love of Serbian, and we are seeing more and more white pine weevil, even though the <laughs> weevil says white pine, it actually will affect uh, some spruces. So, and it does seem to have an affinity for 
for Serbian. So you may need to treat if you start seeing that become a become an issue for you. Uh, Eastern hemlock, uh, the native hemlock here again, the, the quintessential conifer for shade, right? They grow in the understory and and can do quite well there. Although they will grow well in the open too, uh, they'll do well in shade. But if you give it time to acclimate uh, to an open area, it can it can grow in the open areas as well. And there's lots of uh, cultivars out there, Gents White, Everett Golden, um, there's uh, Brooklyn. So some of these different cultivars, if you're looking for things with different effects, uh, there's lots of lots of things out there we can do with hemlock. Again, we, we, the trouble we run into as soon as we say something is pest free, uh, and we typically haven't had a lot of issues with hemlocks, but we are starting to see some pockets of hemlock woolly adelgid infestation here in Michigan, primarily on the west side of the state, brought in on nursery stock. We don't know whether or not these infestations are spreading or what's gonna happen with them, uh, but certainly something to keep an eye on as you're thinking about uh, hemlock. It doesn't seem to be a very fast moving thing. The areas in the country that have had it have had it for some time, uh, but uh, again, it, it is something that, that bears watching. In a lot of these areas, we see this you know, over here in uh, Ohio, that's an area that have a lot of nurseries. And then again, the infestations we have here in Michigan appear to be related to nursery stock. Adelgids are like, uh, they're sucking insects like, like uh, aphids. And so, and when they, when they suck, they inject some chemicals into the tree and cause, cause problems. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. White spruce. So white spruce is kind of, a, to me, it's sort of a bit of an unsung hero. <laughs> we get lots of requests, you know, what can I plant as an alternative to spruce, you know, blue spruce. And, and white spruce is actually a pretty good alternative. It's a native uh, here in Michigan and handles a lot of different stresses, drought, heat, uh, can handle a little bit of wet feet even, which not all conifers can. And so that's one I would, I would encourage folks to, to consider. And there's several cultivars out there if you want something a little more uh, you know, out of the ordinary than the standard old white spruce. This is, uh, again, a couple shots from Hidden Lake Gardens. This is a Pisiglocca pendulous, a weeping white spruce. And this is one called Ford Ann. So that fits in that irregular category. I showed you the Uncle Foggy. This is kind of a, a relation here of, uh, you know, this tree doesn't quite know which way it's going. Uh, neighbors may, may or may not approve of, of that one. Uh, don't overlook Norway spruce. So obviously we know Norway spruce is kind of a standard around here, but there are a gazillion cultivars of Norway spruce. So when you look in the nursery catalogs, um, I think because it's so widely grown in Europe and the, and the uh, nursery people have been looking at it for so long and it tends to throw these witch's broom and, and other uh, mutations that it, that it ends up a lot in the, in the nursery trade. So um, something to, to keep an eye on that we can do there. Um, another tree that I really like is Alaska false cypress. And this is uh, the scientific name. So when you, when you took your master gardener training, we, you know, why do we use scientific names, right? Well, because there's so much confusion over common names, right? I already talked about white fur is, uh, you know, it's white fur out West, it's con color fur here in the Midwest and, and in the East. Okay, so we use scientific names, genus, species, you know, Latinized, all that. Well, uh, this is a tree that's really gone through an identi identity crisis. When I was a forestry student at Washington State in the early 1980s, I learned this as Camacypris nucatensis. Okay, we actually called it Alaska yellow cedar because of, there we go with, with common names again. Well, uh, in the early 2000s, there was a new conifer discovered in Vietnam of all places and people determined well that's kind of similar to this other thing and they went in they looked at the records they said well these two actually belong in the same genus and it should be xanthocyperus nucatensis and that prompted a bunch more analysis and debate among taxonomists and they said no somebody else really identified this first as calotropsis and then they've done a whole reclassification based on DNA and other markers that basically puts all of these things into the cupressus. So the current name is actually cupressus nutcatensis. So for all of that, uh, it's still a great tree. And this is what you see. So 
uh, Alaska fall cypress, Alaska yellow cedar. It occurs in, uh, as you might expect, in Alaska, but actually occurs also in the Cascades. If you're ever up around Mount Rainier in that area, grows in areas where they get a ton of snow. So Mount Rainier, if you've ever been to paradise on Mount Rainier, it gets 1,200 inches of snow a year on average. Okay, 100 feet of snow is the average snowfall at, at uh, paradise. And so uh, they get a ton of snow up there. And so by having this sort of droopy habit, the, the plant doesn't accumulate snow, it doesn't break off its branches, all of that. Here's one at my place a couple of years ago when we have this heavy snow, you see all the snow hanging on the spruces, you know, everything just sloughed right off of the, of the Alaska cypress there. So a great tree, good growth rate. Um, these are ones over by plant biology here on campus and, and, they're, doing, and they're doing great. So nice, nice tree. Uh, I'm gonna, move along here because I'm already running out of time. I knew this would happen. Um, so I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit. I want to just highlight a few things that we probably should try to avoid. And these are things mainly due to pest issues uh, and then probably just overuse are, are things that we really want to avoid. Scotch pine, Scotch pine or Scotch pine um, really has a whole raft of issues. It's unfortunate, a very stress tolerant tree. Uh, but unfortunately, this is lophodermia is a needle cast disease that it gets, also gets pine moth. I think Deb McCullough is our entomologist here at MSU, and she works with different forest trees and, and Christmas trees and whatnot. And I think she had somebody count, there's like 30 different insect pests that get on uh, Scott's pine. And so unfortunately, the trees often look good when they're young. And then as they get to about the age of about a Christmas tree uh, is when things start to start to fall apart. Christmas trees can manage them, but they do a lot of spring and it really takes a lot of effort to get them up to, to Christmas tree size. So uh, unless you're looking for a lot of headaches, I would, I would avoid uh, Scotch pine. Uh, Austrian pine, same story, look great early on. It's really a, a tough tree, it's drought hardy, uh, can handle a lot, can handle road salt, can handle a lot of different things. But unfortunately, it has several uh, key pests, uh, mostly fungal diseases, but it can get some insects as well. Uh, Dothostroma needle blight is a major one. And then the big one is Seropsis or Diplodia tip blight. And unfortunately, the trees often look good till they're about 15 years old. And you think, oh, this thing looks really good. And then boom, uh, the Diplodia takes over and it kills back the, the new growth and it, it really makes the trees look like look like heck and not really a whole lot uh, that can be done to, to treat for it. So best just to stay away from Scots pine and Austrian pine. Blue spruce, uh, probably if you're <laughs> within the sound of my voice, uh, you probably have seen some blue spruce lately that look, that look pretty ragged. And this is not a new thing. I actually have a book on my shelf from Liberty Hyde Bailey, who's sort of the father of American horticulture. I think the, the publication date was like 1921. And he talks about the issues with blue spruce here in the Midwest. So, you know, we've kind of been fighting this battle for a long time. People love the blue color. I get it. But uh, the tree just has so many problems. Arises fear of needle cast. So when you see... Uh, blue spruce and they're dropping the needles from the bottom up. That's typically rhizosphera. And uh, in theory, you can treat for it. It takes a couple fungicide applications every spring. Basically, they're protective sprays. You're spraying the new growth to prevent the new infection, right? So you have to do this every year. So it's going to be a perpetual, uh, you know, in perpetuity, basically, you're going to be treating that tree. So you know, how much do you really like that tree or would you rather just, you know, start over uh, you can limb them up. That does help a little bit, but it's probably going to progress at some point. The other thing, and, and part of the problem with the blue spruce is not just one thing. If it were just the needle cast, you, we might be able to manage that. But we also have uh, some branch canker diseases. Cy Cytospora is a branch canker. And what's characteristic about Cytospora, when you see this, is these individual branches are dying out on this thing. And so what happens there is you actually get a canker. There's a fungal infection that occurs in that branch. And so the, the point of, from that point on, then the, then the branch dies back. And again, very little you can do to treat that. Prune out the branch is about the only thing. We also now see Phomopsis cankers on blue spruce. So it's just sort of this whole you know, uh, syndrome, really, if you will, this complex 
uh, disease issue that's really are, are hammering blue spruces and it's and it's getting harder and harder to find uh, spruces that look good. Sometimes you'll see them, right? Uh, but oftentimes they look good, they look good, and then, oh my God, this thing's falling apart, and then it goes goes downhill. Um, dwarf Alberta, this one's not really terrible. It's more overplanting, and then they are prone to this kind of winter desiccation that you'll often see, uh, especially when we have a very cold winter or winter with a lot of wind exposure on these things. You'll get this uh, browning out on these. They also get spruce spider mites, uh, can be a problem as well. Uh, we already talked about the reversion thing. We'll have to talk about that again. So um, that's that's the, the Dwarf Alberta spruce story. Interesting how things change. When I first started doing these talks, I've been at MSU a little over 20 years now. I actually had Douglas fir on my recommended list. But what's happened with Douglas fir here in the Midwest, first of all, it's not native here. So that's that becomes, you know, it often sets us up for, for some issues. But we have a couple of different uh, needle cast diseases. So there's uh, rab decline needle cast and Swiss needle cast. And so it's really hard anymore to keep Douglas fir looking good without, without a lot of effort. Christmas tree growers can do it again, but they manage, uh, they will grow, uh, or they will spray a couple times each spring uh, to keep, the, to keep the, the needle cast at bay, but it really takes a lot of a lot of effort. I'm going to move along, go through some of my underused. So these are some things that I think are pretty good. Uh, generally, again, knock on whatever when we say a few pests, but things that are generally pretty well adapted here have good form and maybe a little less planter. You might have to look a little bit to find them at a nursery. Um, Wegans, uh, G Farms. I don't get any kickbacks on these, but those are some places that tend to have maybe some of the, the less common types of, of things. A Swiss stone pine. So here's stone pine. That usually means pines that have large seeds and often have edible uh, seeds, and these do. Uh, actually, all pine, all pine seeds are edible. The question is which ones are big enough to make it worth your while. Uh, and so, you know, pinion pines, of course, are the ones that you typically find when you buy pine nuts. But stone pines are also uh, edible. And this is one that uh, wherever you see this tree, kind of a compact uh, growth form to it, but uh, really tends to always look good. I've seen these in Minnesota and different arboreta and, and they, always, uh, they always tend to tend to look good. Korean pine, very closely related to our white pine. Um, I tend to tell people if they're interested in Korean pine, it's sort of a smaller, tougher version of our white pine. And so it's one that whenever I've seen it, again, this is actually an arboretum in, in Minneapolis at uh, the University of Minnesota, excuse me, St. Paul, University of Minnesota, uh, Arboretum, and uh, it'll grow here. There's some at, at Hidden Lake Gardens, and it's a great, great, uh, great tree. Limber pine, another one of our five needle pines from the west, um, tends to do pretty good. Uh, there's million, several different cultivars out there. This is Vanderwolf's Pyramid, get that bluish color and kind of conical form to it. Korean fir, I like a lot. Uh, we actually have some of our Christmas tree growers that produce uh, Korean fir. It's well adapted here in Michigan. Uh, there are a number of different cultivars out there that have been selected for different traits. Um, one is blue cones. We talked about firs having their cones upright. There you see it. And so these will look good through the summer. You'll see the cones like this. And then in the fall, the cones will fall apart. And here's last year's cone stalk. So the cones just kind of disintegrate uh, and the, the stalks stay on the tree. And then all the scales sort of the seeds sort of fall off. Uh, this is another one called Silverlock, and hopefully you can pick that up. It has what we call recurved knee needles. So the needles kind of turn back upwards, and then they have these white bands or silvery bands of stomata underneath, and you get that uh, silver, silver uh, lock, I guess it's silver hair. Is that right in German? Anyway, uh, get that silver, silver. You get the silver out of it anyway. So there you go. Uh, bald cypress, the tree I really like. Deciduous conifer, I just showed you the one earlier at uh, Anthony Hall here at MSU. I've actually seen it starting to be used as a uh, street tree. This is actually in Forest Grove, Grove Park, one of those tree tree suburbs in Chicago. They, they, they all run together after a while, but they, they've planted these in the tree lawn here, and then they limb them up. They need the sight line to have it as a street tree, but they're salt tolerant 
and so they can they can do well in these in these kind of situations. Here's an example from uh, my backyard, and um, I had this area in the back where it always rained and filled in. I couldn't mow right early part of the spring, like now. And so uh, why fight why fight things? So I planted a bald cypress there. Um, doesn't look like much because it's still was, was right about now. You know early early, you know, late winter, early spring, when we're getting all of our snow melt and rain and whatnot. But, um, you know, a few years later, and this thing is doing great, right? And I don't have to mow that wet spot anymore. So there you go. Uh, oh, you know, perfect, perfect tree for wet areas, bald cypress. Another one that does well in wet areas is actually another deciduous conifer, and that's Don Redwood. And uh, one of the all-time great uh, scientific names, Metasequoia glyptostroboides, rolls right off the tongue, right? Uh, and it's another one of these areas down here at the Harper Collection. It's in the Lowland uh, Collection because it, it can tolerate some wet feet. Has these very nice uh, needle-like leaves. We've got some here on the campus. There's three of them right out in front of this Plant and Soil Science Building, Plant Biology, and here's our three Don Redwoods out in front, and they're doing they're doing great. Get kind of a nice russet red in the fall. They're deciduous, so they'll be bare uh, through the winter, but then they leaf out nice bright green, and then they're uh, kind of russet red in the in the fall. There's actually getting to be some uh, cultivars of Don Redwood. This is one called Gold Rush. So people are starting to select some some uh, cultivars of of those. So kind of a, a quick run through these. So um, yeah, hopefully you took notes as we went through these. But uh, some things I recommend: you know, white pine, a concolor fir, Serbian white pine, and Serbian both starting to show some issues with the white pine weevil, but I think they still are, are worth worth looking at uh, eastern hemlock white spruce definitely norway spruce and the alaska false cypress definitely um you know if you can avoid scots pine austrian pine blue spruce especially douglas fir we don't tend to use a lot anyway but uh certainly you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of headaches if you do and then some of these i think are kind of the the unsung uh, conifers there the stone pine korean pine limber pine korean fir bald cypress and don redwood i like the the deciduous conifers a lot, just, just interesting plants. I'm gonna go just a couple minutes over. I know I'm up against the time here, but just wanna point out if you haven't been, I really encourage you to get down to Hidden Lake. Uh, it's not far, it's just down by Brooklyn, down where the speed track is, uh, down there in, in South Central uh, Michigan by, I guess Tipton is the nearest, is that right, Tecumseh, Tipton down there uh, area. And it's a great, great place. I think they bumped up the admission. It might be like $5 now, but it's not much. And I think they're open maybe every day, but Christmas, uh, it's, it's open almost all the time. They have a website, Google Hidden Lake Gardens, and you get the detail. There's the map, so you can kind of see where it's at. At least coming from, here's Lansing. So down, I go through Jackson, and then down that way, you all would probably go down through Brighton and Ann Arbor and probably head across. Uh, but uh, it's a great, uh, great place. And really uh, lots to see. They have a huge uh, crab apple collection. Uh, there's trails, there's roads, uh, hiking trails. You can take your dog. How many places can you take your dog anymore, right? Um, so that's a great, a great thing to do. Wintertime, cross-country skiing or snowshoeing. Awesome bonsai collection. If you like that sort of thing, they've got a conservatory. And then uh, Jack Weichel here has been uh, leading their program for years and years on developing bonsai and they do workshops and all kinds of things there. Uh, World-class hosta collection, the hosta hillside. Uh, there really is a hidden lake at Hidden Lake Gardens. It's a great, it's a great spot, but the big attraction, at least for me, is uh, the Harper collection. I, I showed you earlier, you know, spent quite a bit of time with, with Chubb when he was still alive and, and imparted a lot of, of wisdom and information on, on conifers to me and I'm grateful for that. Um, just a very quick background. I know I'm out of time here, but uh, so Chubb was one of these guys that got the addicted conifer syndrome. He, he was the grounds manager for uh, John Deere uh, at their world headquarters in, in Moline, Illinois, and started collecting conifers around his house and then uh, leased a couple of lots in the neighborhood, hopefully with his wife permission anyway and just kept going and going and finally realized okay I, there's only so much i can do with this and so he was looking for a home for these for these plants he had over 300 of these different conifers at his place and so um 
it was Davy Tree uh, actually donated the labor. They hand dug, you can see them here, bald and burlap. They hand dug all these trees, uh, loaded them to three semis, and then uh, transported them to Hidden Lake Gardens. And this is actually right after the uh, planting. I believe this was early 80s, I want to say about 83 or so. Sam Lovell was the, the landscape architect. He's still involved with, with the collection there at, at Hidden Lake and, and some of the evaluations and replacements as time has gone on. But that's how it, uh, but that's how it started. And it absolutely is a world-class uh, conifer collection. And for most of us, it, it's probably less than an hour, hour and a half drive away. So if you're, if you this stuff interests you at all, um, and I thank Jack Weichel for a lot of these photos here of the different seasons, uh, it's certainly worth, worth a trip down. And uh, it's really a place like no other in, in this part of the world. So, okay, I'm going to wrap it up there. I think we maybe had a couple questions come in. If you want to fire away on those, I will be happy to take them. Sure, we had uh, several questions come through through the chat while you're talking. Uh, the first one was regarding the witches' brooms. What do you graft the cuttings to? Um, usually, but not always, uh, seedlings of the same species. There are some uh, understock that work better. Um, I'm not an expert on on grafting by any means, but typically it would be something at least in the same genus, if not the same species. But you can actually, uh, there are some interspecific or even intergeneric grafts that you can do, but there are, and I don't know exactly myself, which, which ones are the best understock, but there are certain uh, trees that'll be done, used for that. If you ever go to G Farms, ask Gary G. Gary does a lot of his own propagation. And I'm sure if you're not careful, I had a grad student went down there one time to look at some stuff and she ended up back in his shop and he was showing her how to graph before she was, before she was done. So we actually did have a question on G Farms. Um, do you know if all of their plants are labeled there or is it just a collection? In the, in the Arboretum, um, mostly it's not, it's not really a public thing. Uh, I think it's mostly, I think he shows, he, I think part of it is for, propagation stock part of it's just his own interest and then um so it's not labeled now at hidden lake gardens everything is clearly labeled that's part of the part of the program there um so if with gary's stuff you might have to look around to find a label or find gary um so it's it's probably labeled but you're gonna have to look for it it's not really a I, like so i said i would ask before you went in there but if you say you know i heard that you, you know, there's an arboretum here uh, can we go take a look? I doubt they'll say no, um, but uh, you probably have to look for labels. Okay, and then we had somebody asking for a suggestion for a conifer that um, would be good for like under the wire, under like power wires, I'm guessing that can withstand. Yeah, yeah, there's, so there's, there's lots. I would say, um, well, certainly something like Black Hill spruce. Uh, so Black Hill spruce, it's a Pisces Glock. It's a white spruce. I need, you know, I've seen more about exposure and drainage and everything else. Uh, but as a, as a general response, I'd say something like uh, uh, Black Hill spruce, which is a, a form of, of white spruce. It's a Pisces Glock of variety densata. And it's more of a compact grower. It's probably in that um, maybe not even to the intermediate, about a six inches a year. So it would take a while before it ever got up into the, up into the wire. But definitely look at those uh, dwarf forms. So things maybe six inches or less would probably be good, good choices. And again, if you look at G Farms catalog, he lists them all. Uh, they all have the growth rate in the form. That's, that's why they do that with the American Conifer Society. So you can look at that growth rate. And then somebody was asking if you could talk about the Canaan firs specifically. How is it different from balsam and Douglas fir and Fraser fir? Yeah. So Canaan fir is a geographic seed source. So sometimes you'll hear, especially Christmas tree farms, will say, "Well, it's a cross between Fraser and balsam." It's not. It's actually a, a seed source of balsam fir that occurs in the Canaan Valley of West Virginia. It has traits that are intermediate between Fraser fir and balsam fir, and that's why people think it's a hybrid or maybe some kind of intermediate. But it has better site tolerance than Fraser fir. Fraser fir we typically don't recommend as a landscape tree. I mean, everybody, they, you know, lots of people grow it as Christmas trees, but it really needs. It's very finicky. It's kind of a prima donna. It wants well-drained acidic soils, 
all of that, very susceptible to phytophthora root rot. So it needs the, the good drainage. Canane fir is a little bit more like balsam in the fact that it can withstand some wetter soils. It can also stand, stand a little bit higher pH than Fraser fir. So canane fir, yeah, potentially could be a good, a good landscape tree for you. Yep. And then somebody asked, um, does Hidden Lakes, do they have tours of their conifer area to point out some of the highlights? Or? That's a good question. I don't know that they do. What I would do is I'd get on their website. I know they do have events different times of the year. They have plant sales and they have different events. I don't, there's not like, you know, every Sunday at three kind of thing, but they do, I think from time to time, I've given some down there using an association with different you know, landscape meetings or things like that, uh, but it's it's you probably have to check their website and see. I know they do some things with their with their bonsai where they do workshops and things like that, and they probably have some things for the conifers as well. There's I think they have like a newsletter on their on their website, so I would go look there. And then we also had a, a question about um, if the reversions for like an Alberta spruce, can you revert? Can you remove that? Um, <laughs> yes, it's it's the old Barney Fife thing. You got to nip it, nip it, nip it in the bud. So you got to, as soon as you see that, so that one was gone, right? The one I showed you, there was no way you're going to, you just have, you just have a white spruce now at that point. But what you want to do, and, and the folks at Hidden Lake Gardens are looking for this all the time because a lot of these things can revert. And so what you want to do is as soon as you see that, you have to get in there and as far back in as you can get to it, you want to prune that, you want to prune that out. Yep, got a nip in the bud. Is there a certain length that you need to go down for that? Like As far as, I mean, it's wherever that branch starts, I would get as far in as I could, okay. yep. And then if there's any other questions, please feel free to unmute and um, chime in. Um, it's been a great presentation. Thank you so much for your okay. time. Good. All right. Well, thanks everyone for your attention. I'm going to quit sharing and I'll bid everyone a fond adieu and hope everyone gets out and enjoys the rest of this beautiful evening. Yes, you too, sir. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.